combination to reset. Select level. There's an old blues song by an old blues player called Albert King, named Albert King. And there's this line in this song, everybody wants to go to heaven, but nobody wants to die. Everybody wants to go to heaven, but nobody wants to die. What a, what a great sentiment that is, right? What a true statement that is. But I tend to think, though, when it comes to relationships, we sing a very similar tune. Everybody wants a great relationship. Nobody wants to lay their life down for it. Everybody wants a great relationship, a great marriage, but nobody wants to lay their preferences down in order to get there. We all want to be in a lasting, deep, loving relationship, but no one wants to lay their dreams and desires down. It's almost one of those, no, you go first moments. If you do that, then maybe I'll consider it. We all want the beauty of what I call the we without the self-sacrifice of the me. Everybody wants to go to heaven. Nobody wants to die. Maybe this is why so many of our relationships feel stuck in first gear, never really able to hit their stride. Maybe this is why so many of us are stuck in this perpetual tug of war between what you want and what I want and what I think we need and what you think we need. Maybe this is why uh, everyone that you date is, is not really Mr. Right or Mrs. Right. It's close but never perfect. Maybe this is why we fight over the dumbest of things and we divide over issues that don't really matter. Maybe this is why so many relationships grew strained over COVID. Because suddenly when we are trapped together in the same home, we realize that though we have been living together, we have no idea how to work together. See, all of us want to go to heaven. Nobody wants to die. We all want the best that a relationship can offer, but nobody wants to lay their life down to get there. But when we look at what God says about relationships, we find that God sings a different tune than the one the world does, than the one that our flesh does. When God speaks about relationships, he speaks about fostering a we before me. God speaks of we before me. And the secret, according to God, then, of fostering deep, long-lasting relationships, both in the church, outside of the church, in our marriages, outside of our marriages, is our willingness to set ourselves aside in the interest of others. I call it the gospel rule of we before me. And we see this in Paul's writings in Philippians chapter 2. But it's not just what scripture says, it's what Jesus does. And this is where Paul points in Philippians chapter 2. So turn with me in your Bibles to the New Testament. That's two-thirds of the way through your Bibles, the New Testament book of Philippians, Philippians chapter 2. Philippians is after First and Second Corinthians, and then you hit a series of epistles, which are little biblical letters written to these churches, Galatians, Ephesians, then Philippians, Colossians. Remember our rule for remembering those in order, GEPC, General Electric Power Company, so find the P, find Philippians, Philippians chapter 2. Paul here writing this letter to a church, he speaks not just to the gospel, but the implications of the gospel in our lives. Because for Paul, it's not just about what you know, it's not just about what you believe, it's whether you're willing to take that and live it out in every area of your life. And he writes about this in Philippians chapter 2, an implication of the gospel on our relationships with one another. Philippians 2, beginning at verse 1. So if there is any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the Spirit, any affection and sympathy, complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind, he writes. Do nothing from selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. 
have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men and being found in human form. He humbled himself by being obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So Paul's written this letter to the church in Philippi. He's speaking to them of the gospel and the implications of the gospel on their lives, uh, on the things that they are facing. Again, the gospel for Paul is more than just theology, it's also practice. More than just belief, it's belief in life, in action. He he speaks of the gospel and then wants them to understand the implication of this on how they relate to one another and what they are willing to do for one another. This is why in chapter 1, he begins with the gospel, he talks about conducting themselves in a manner worthy of the gospel, which which would lead to this natural conclusion, or this natural question, well, what does that mean? What does it mean to conduct yourself in a manner worthy? So Paul says, well, let me tell you what it means to conduct yourself in a manner worthy of Jesus. Here's what it looks like to conduct yourself, to live in a way worthy of Jesus. So, verse 1 Your translation we read, therefore, because he's building off of this premise, therefore, if there's any encouragement, any comfort from love, any participation in the Spirit, any affection and sympathy, do this. Complete my joy. Live this way. I love these if any statements. If there's any modicum of Christ's work in your life, if there's any comfort from his love, if there's any participation in the Spirit. Paul Paul is making this statement here that is so broad and so inclusive that, that if you've had any encouragement from Christ's teaching at all, whether you've been in Christ for 50 years or just the last five minutes, if there is any comfort, any encouragement, any participation whatsoever of the Spirit, meaning that now that you're following Jesus, the Spirit is in you, you're participating in this great work. The moment that you invite Christ in, the Spirit comes in, that begins to happen. So if there is any of that in your life, even to the smallest degree, this is how you're supposed to live. This is what it looks like, he says. Do this. Verse 2, have the same mind, the same love, would have been full accord and of one mind. This is what it looks like if Jesus is in you, have the same mind, have the same love, live in full accord, having one mind. He's not saying, don't misunderstand Paul here, he's not saying you need to think the same as everybody else. He's not saying that you all now need to say, uh, share the same preferences, like have the same mind. Like everybody now has to like chocolate, not vanilla, right? Like everyone has to like this color of carpet. No one can disagree. That, that, that's not what he's talking about, the, the things that we normally get split on. He's saying, no, make your focus Jesus. That's what he means by the same mind, same love, being in full accord. Make Jesus your focus Make his kingdom your aim. And here's why. Because if Jesus becomes the most important thing and the greatest focus, it will keep you from dividing over lesser things. If we agree that Jesus is the greater thing, then it keeps us from arguing over lesser things. Or at least it should. If we can agree that Jesus is the greater thing, then we find that we actually share the greatest commonality. We have the most in common because the most important thing in life is the thing that you and I share. Which means then splitting and saying we have nothing in common is no longer an option for the Christian. Because we have in common 
the greatest thing. And it keeps us focused and it keeps us then from dividing over the lesser things. See, see our problem so often in relationships, and, and again, I'm speaking now of those of us who are following Jesus. Our problem as followers of Jesus in relationships is that so often we make too little of Jesus and too much of other things. I'm convinced that that is one of the biggest problems and barriers in our relationships. And Paul's writing this to the church as to how they interact with one another and whether they will love one another. And this is especially true then of the church and our willingness to love one another. That we make too much of other things and not enough of Jesus. We put our eyes on other things instead of keeping our eyes on Jesus. We think too little of eternal matters and too much of earthly matters. He says, be of the same mind, have the same love. And our problem so often is as Christians, we say this, uh, Jesus is the most important thing, right? Aren't you glad we're brothers and sisters in Christ? We, we say these platitudes, but when it comes to actually living them out in our Christian experience, well, we'll just go ahead and block someone on Facebook for not believing my politics, I mean, we, we share the same love for Jesus. We're both pursuing his kingdom, but you're not also pursuing the kingdom of fill in the blank. I, I'm going to block you. I, I can't be friends with you. I can't even listen to this nonsense. It doesn't matter that you love Jesus. But if you disagree with me on this, if you don't hold the same party line, then I don't really know how we can be in relationship. What does that do? That is putting something else as a greater importance than Jesus. That we would divide over something lesser, something earthly, something that, hear me say this, it will absolutely someday fade away. And we would divide over those things instead of making much of Jesus. And the problem in this is that we so badly, ultimately, want people just to agree with us. But what happens when our aim is to have people who always agree with us? It makes us the standard in the relationship, right? What, what Paul's trying to do here is get us off of making us the standard by which we live by, and instead making Jesus the standard by which we live by. What, when we make us the standard in our views or our preferences or our desires or our needs at any given moment, we become the standard. And if you have become the standard in your relationships, then you have supplanted Jesus with yourself. Paul's saying if you really love Jesus, the way that that comes out of you, the way the gospel comes out of you, is by making him supreme, everything else lesser. That's why he goes on and says in verses 3 and 4 then, do nothing from selfish ambition. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit. Your translation may read vain conceit. But in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests but also to the interests of others. Meaning the gospel rule of relationships is not waking up every morning thinking of me. The gospel rule of relationships is waking up thinking of we, of something greater than the me. I, I'm not just serving my interests, I'm thinking of yours. He calls us to put aside me, do nothing from selfish ambition. That phrase, term, selfish ambition, is literally do nothing for the benefit of yourself. I like thinking in that term, right? I, I don't think of myself as having selfish ambition, right? Like I'm not going to plow over people just to make more money or to get this job and, you know, do harm to that person so that I can be greater, right? But when I think of it in the terms of do nothing for the benefit of yourself, suddenly that reframes everything in my relationship. Because how often, as we've acknowledged previous in the series, right, do we do things around the house not necessarily because we love to do those or even love the person for whom we're doing them, but we're hoping that they would take notice of that and it would somehow benefit us in return. I, I wash the pots and pans, not because I love pots and pans and not even really because I love you. I wash the pots and hands because I love what I get from you. The minute that comes into play, it shows that we're actually operating not for the benefit of others, the interest of others, but for the interest of ourselves. 
Oh, how often I operate for the benefit of myself. And Paul says, no, we put that aside. And understand that Paul's not saying that you can't have needs. You can't ever think of your needs. You can't ever have me time or pull yourself together after a hard and stressful day with the kids. No, I love what he says in verse 4. Think not only of your own interests, but also the interests of others. Think not only of your own interests. It's not that you shouldn't have interests. It's not that they don't matter. It's that they are not preeminent any longer. There is another entity that you must concern yourself with in this relationship. Paul's saying that we have to recognize in a relationship there's a, there's a we now that's more important than me. This is especially true in marriage. Let's just talk about marriage for a moment. This is especially true in marriage. Genesis 2.24 says when God brought man and woman together, the two became what? One flesh, right? The two became one flesh. That in this moment, God does something that only a creator can do. Because again, God is the creator, he created life. What he did with Adam and Eve, these two separate individuals, is he brought them together and he created one new entity. In this moment, these two entities, these two individuals with two preferences, with two ways of operating, ceased to be so that one new entity, one new family could be created and could emerge. The implication of this, then, is the, not that the, the woman would just assume the man's everything and his perspective and his leadership and he's the decision maker and I'm just a follower. No, 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 no. And it's also not that the man just defers everything over to the woman. Well, it's whatever you want, honey, whatever you want. No, no, no. It's that the two submit to one another and that these two would take up one new path together. Not that one of those individuals' path becomes the preeminent way, but both get submitted to find one new together. See, the reality is most couples don't realize that when they're dressing up on their wedding day, when they've spent all that money on the gown, all that money on a party, all that money on the cake, that what they're getting ready to do is celebrate with one of the most expensive funerals they've ever paid for. They've invited everybody to see them die to themselves. Because what we're doing in that moment at the altar, all dressed up with everybody watching, is saying, I am going to choose to submit and defer. And the other one's saying, okay, now it's my turn. I am going to choose to submit and defer. This is why Paul says in Ephesians 5, 21, we submit to one another out of reverence for Jesus Christ. And he goes on from there. To, Wives, this is what it looks like. It looks like for you to submit and honor your husbands. And husbands, this is what it looks like. It looks for you to love your wife to the point that you're willing to lay your life down for her. And so often we get hung up in, the, in that passage about, well, one is submitting and the other is the head. Notice what it says, though, about headship in that passage and the head of Jesus being the head of the church. What did Jesus do for the church? As the head of the church, he died for it. As the head of the church, he laid his life down for it. Which is why Paul begins that entire paragraph with this call to mutual submission. That we would get all dressed up and invite all of our friends to come and hear us say, I will no longer think of myself, but I will lay my life down for you because the self has ceased to be. And the gospel rule then is we before me. The gospel rule, we before me. Paul's saying, hey, we are to live for Christ that's the same mind, same love, being in full accord. Live for Christ. Die to self so that we might give our lives in service to one another. It's the call of the gospel that we would live for Christ. We would die to self so that we might give our lives in humble service to one another. Here's the, the secret that God knows then that we often forget. 
to put it in real simple, real practical terms, the healthiest relationships then belong to those who seek to outserve one another in love. The healthiest relationships belong to those who seek to outserve one another in love. Paul's saying, man, take up this mind. And this is what it looks like in your relationships, that you focus on Jesus and then seek to outserve one another in love, considering not only your own interests, but the interests of others, and making sure that those in your heart are more important to you than your own, than yourself. Far too many people then assume that in marriage, it's one submitting while the other leads. But the gospel calls us to a life of mutual submission. I loved how this played out in the life and marriage of an old mentor of mine. When his kids had moved out of the home and they became empty nesters and they, they found in that period of life where things shift and now all of a sudden it's just us, right? And, and, and how is this going to play out? And suddenly the, the place where we poured all of our attention and focus is now gone. And in the midst of that season, he was very studious, had a PhD, would have been content just to sit out on the back porch and read a book all of the time. But his, his wife was looking for something more. And this new chapter in life, she wanted to do new things that they had never done before. And though he was so bookish, he loved his wife so much that he committed himself to taking dance classes. Now, if you'd ever met my mentor, my friend, you would have immediately pointed at him and said, of all the people in this room, that's the guy who can't dance, right? Of all the people in the room, that's the guy who should be sitting at home with a book, right? And yet he so loved his wife that he committed himself not just to a few weeks, but months. And every Friday night, then, they would get up, and they would get dressed, and they would go out, and they would dance because it was something she had always wanted to do. And one morning at breakfast as we were talking, I asked him, well, like, how's it going? Are you enjoying it? And he's like, oh, no, I'm not enjoying it. He's like, I, I, I just don't like dancing. Like me being in a huge crowd of people with loud music and everybody watching us on the floor, this couldn't be the first, this is like the furthest thing from, from how I'm wired. And I'm like, well, th there, there wasn't anything like else that you guys could agree on? He's like, oh, I'm sure we could have found something else. But when she talked about this, her eyes lit up. When she talked about this, I saw something in her I haven't seen in a long, long time. And so what did he do? He pulled himself out on a dance floor and was willing to have people chuckle so that his wife might smile. Healthiest relationships are driven by those who seek to outserve one another in love. It's the power of we before me. It's the power of the gospel. It's the power of the call of Christ. And it was his very example, which is exactly where Paul goes next. Verse 5, have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Stop there. Paul says this is not just the gospel. It's not just how I want you to live your life. He said the reason this is how you are to live your life is because this is how Jesus lived his and if you want to follow in the way of Jesus, then we follow in the way of self-sacrifice. We follow in the way of submission. Jesus, though he was God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, meaning something to be held onto. Jesus did not come into the room and you're like, guys, I'm God. Like, I shouldn't have to sit on the floor. Someone find me a chair. I, I shouldn't have to, to deal with this stuff anymore, guys. Like, come on, you guys know what to do. Jesus never walked into a room and, and demanded anything because of his divinity or because of who, his status, because of who he was. Jesus instead 
allowed himself to be viewed and treated like a servant. Jesus was the one who got up and washed the disciples' feet, even the feet of the man who would betray him. Jesus took on the form of a servant. He was willing to become nothing in order that we might gain everything. It's the gospel rule of we before me. He did it for the glory of God, for the good of others. One might say to the detriment of himself by dying on a cross as he trusted the Lord with the plan. The question, of course, in this is, man, how do you even do that? I mean, how do you, how do, you do this? And, and the reality is there's so much fear behind it. If, if I lay my life down, if I become the servant of you, if I wash your feet, I'm not sure that you're going to wash mine. I mean, if I commit myself to serve you and meet all of your needs, who's going to meet mine? See, there's so much fear behind this. Because we're preoccupied with our own needs and our own desires, and we're not sure that, I, that we can trust you to meet what we need. And so we always hold a little bit back. So here's the thing. The enemy loves to capitalize on this, and in the fear of not having our needs met to keep us from living into the gospel call in our lives. There's two things about this. First, understand that if both people in the relationship are seeking to honor God by serving one another, if each half in the relationship is seeking to meet the needs of the other, then according to God's design, no needs will be unmet. If both parties are seeking to do this, then your needs won't be abandoned. They won't be ignored. Well, I don't know if I can trust him with that. No, no, the question is, can you trust God with that? See, that, that's why Paul begins with having the same mind, the same love, the same focus, right? This is why we've repeatedly said, eyes up, not out. It's not a question of whether you trust your spouse. It's a, whether of, it's a question of whether you trust the gospel and whether you trust what God is saying will work. And if we believe this, then we can pour ourselves in and trust that our needs will not go unmet. That our spouse will either pour in or God will somehow provide. Again, the question comes up, but, but, but what if they don't? What if they don't? What if they don't? Well, the second thing in this then is the best way to motivate someone else to lean into the relationship is by you leaning in, right? I mean, the, the best motivation for me to soften my heart to make me pay attention to my wife and her needs is when she goes out of her way and does something stunningly service-oriented for me. It's in those moments that I'm so humbled, in those moments that I realize, like, man, I've spent all week just focused on my schedule and focused on my business, and here you poured out for me in this incredible way. I can't believe how thoughtful you were in that regard. And now it just wells up in me like, man, I, I, I need to pull my own weight around here. I, I, you've thought so much of me, and I've not thought much for you at all. That is incredibly motivating. And it's not just true in a marriage, it's true in any relationship. I, I'm not much of a gift giver. It's not my natural love language. I'm pretty cheap, honestly. Gift giving requires a level of sacrifice that I find uncomfortable. Friday afternoon as we were out, or Friday morning, as we're out and about, we get this text message from good friends. Hey, left something on your doorstop for you. Got home and saw it. It was the simplest of gifts, but it, it, it spoke my love language. It was chocolate. And, and the, the thoughtfulness that someone would spend time that week thinking of me and my stomach just pulled me out of this week where I had been so concerned with what was happening in my world and, and motivated me all the more. Like, man, I, I've got to work. i got to pour myself out now. Like, man, what can I do for them in return? Like, this was so incredibly generous. Like, what did they need? And I found myself thinking the rest of the afternoon, like, what do they need? See, here's the thing. The best way to motivate someone is not by holding back. The best way to motivate some, someone is not by, by leaning out and protecting yourself. It's actually by leaning in and doing the very thing that the gospel calls us to. 
When that happens, it motivates. Again, it's so hard though, right? Because we have to trust and we have to risk. How do you get to this point where you can give yourself away, where you can trust so fully and trust that it will work out good? And the question is, it's not natural to our flesh. The reality, then, according to the gospel, is really we're incapable of doing this on our own. I love the way that one marriage resource puts it, a resource we use here at Northeast called Reengage, puts it this way You are powerless to love your spouse in the way you promised you could, the way they dreamed that you would and in the way that God designed that you should. You're powerless to love your spouse in the way that you promised on that wedding day. You're powerless to love them in the way that they dream that you can love them on that wedding day. And you're powerless to love them in the way that God calls you to love them. So what's the hope in this? The hope, Paul says, is the gospel. The solution is that you need God's help. And with God's help, you can absolutely be who you need to be, and do what you need to do. Look at what he says again, verse 5. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ. Have this mind. He's pointing to the example of Jesus, this mind and heart of humble, selfless service. Have this mind. And you don't have to try to do this on your own and in your own strength. Why? Because he says it is yours in Christ Jesus. The verb tense there that he uses means it's already been accomplished. It's already been secured. The work has already been done for you. So to be who God wants you to be and to do what God wants you to do is possible because Jesus did the work. In a very real way, the work has been completed. It just now needs to be seized. It's like arriving at at the airport after a flight and being sent to baggage claim. You didn't have to do anything to get your bags there. The only thing required is to claim based on the work that's been done for you. Have this mind in you. Jesus did the work. Jesus has given you his spirit. Jesus has conquered sin and death and the tug and pull of the flesh on you, you just need claim and trust what he has done. See, here's the thing. Only the power of Christ in you can help you do what God calls you to do, what Christ calls you to do. It is impossible for you to be a selfless servant in your marriage unless you trust in Jesus. And when you look to him and when you look to his strength, you become the spouse that you need to be. And not just the spouse you need to be, you become the spouse that your spouse has always dreamed for you to be. When you trust in Christ and his work and you allow him to do that work in you. Very practically speaking, if we could end practically for a moment, what does this mean? What does this mean? First, then in order to see the best in your relationship, you have to first give yourself to God. We'll keep coming back to this point. I'm going to keep preaching this point. But in order to to, to find the best in your relationship, to, to see the best in your relationship, you have to first give yourself to God. It's what Paul, again, points to immediately, like have the same mind, the same love, being in the same full accord, one mind in Jesus, looking to him, Remember what we said a few weeks ago? The best version of you is Jesus in you. When Jesus is in me, I become a humble, selfless servant. My wife rises and calls me blessed. Not not literally, not when I walk in the room, right? But when I become the best version of me by Jesus living in me, directing my thoughts, my attitudes, and my behaviors, that's a woman that my, or that's a man that my, wife loves secondly Paul's calling us then to be a student of the other a student of your spouse a student of the co-worker that's frustrating you 
Like, t- take up not only your own interests, but the interests of others. Make them more significant than yourselves, right? Look to them and what they need. Be a student of yourselves. We are so good at this in the early months, right? In the early months of a relationship. That's why early on when I was dating my wife, one of our very first dates, she jumped in the car and country music was playing. I've told the story before. It's one of her biggest grievances in our relationship because country music doesn't play in the car anymore. I did what needed to be done to get her to the dinner table, and then I won her over with my charm, right? Don't laugh that hard. (laughs) See, the reality is we're really good at studying the other person when we're dating and, and playing into their needs and playing into their interests, and then all of a sudden we get married, and it's like, what, you hate country music? Oh well, yeah, I was just doing that to, like, so we'd get here. What does that say? It says that I spent the earliest part of our relationship serving me, not you. What does it look like then for me to serve her and put her interests ahead of my own? Sometimes that means country music. Sometimes it means doing laundry or helping around the house in a way that that I'm not expecting anything in return. Sometimes it means paying attention to the things that she wants, but she's too afraid to ask for because she's nervous that it might cost too much money and finding a way to make that happen for her because she is special to me and I want her to know that. It's studying my spouse, paying attention to who she is. Last but certainly not least in this, practically speaking, the way to live in this gospel rule of we before me is that my wife and I have committed to never use the D word. We never use divorce. We never speak of it. That word never comes off of our lips. Not in an argument, not in the toughest moments of our marriage, and we have had tough moments. The reason that we never use the D word It's because that word just reeks of me. It reeks of my commitment to myself and my security and my hopes and my dreams that you're not meeting. And when I hold that out there in an argument to try to get you to do what I need you to do, and I'm really not showing a commitment to you, I'm showing a commitment to to me and that I'm willing to part with you if the commitment to me isn't met. And never speak of that in our house. From moment one, we've just made that agreement no matter how hard it is. And in moments when there's been fatal attractions to others and things have been tough and we've had to get help, we have maintained this rule. Why? Because the gospel rule is we before me. And this is what Jesus did for us. When we had been unfaithful, when we had failed, When we were only concerned about ourselves, God so loved us that he sent his son to die for us that we, the unfaithful, might have eternal life in Jesus Christ. Jesus laid his life down to give glory to God. As a part of the Trinity, he was focused on the greater we and willing to submit his own life to that. In order for the good of bringing more to the throne of grace, he submitted his life for that. He never parted and separated when we cried out of the cross, crucify him, and when we mocked him, and when we spat at him. He gave his life for that. This is what it means to follow the way of Jesus, that we'd be willing to submit our very lives for one another and trust that when we do so God sees and God blesses everyone wants to go to heaven nobody wants to die everyone wants the great relationship nobody wants to sacrifice not at that cost but God says you can trust me with that cost and proof of this is not only Jesus' example and what he did for us as a model for us. Proof of this is what Paul goes on to say, that when Christ gave up his life, what did God do? God gave him the greatest glory. And 
God can meet your needs too when we live by the gospel rule. Would you pray with me? Father, we pause in thinking of the profound love of a God who would send his own son on behalf of rebels like us. And oh, how often, Father, we are unwilling to give of ourselves for someone who hasn't met our standards. And we just pause and we say, forgive us. And Father, would you do a work in us and give us a heart like Jesus? Father, would you teach us to serve and to give of ourselves unconditionally in the way that Christ did for us? Father, when we lack the strength, would you teach us to trust and look to you, not to the other? Father, when it's difficult and the other person isn't deserving, would you teach us to trust and rely on you and not look to the other? Father, when we're uncertain if our needs will be met and whether there will be any reward for all that we are doing, may we learn to trust in you and not look to the other. Teach us to trust, Father, that you are a God who will provide, who will bless when we live obediently to how you've called us to live. So teach us, Father, to lay our lives down for one another. We ask it in Jesus' name.